takes two at a time. It's a pleasure and honor that I introduce our next speaker. Um, you're going to learn so much about not only this place, but uh, a whole family's experience. And you're going to learn that one person can make a huge difference in systems. I think I'll leave it at that. It's my pleasure to introduce Frida Sand. You know, I've done this so often that I should have everything memorized instead of having to look, look at all these notes. And if you hear this thumping, that's my part because I'm so nervous. And it's, uh, good afternoon. I'm so pleased to be here with you all to share my daughter Janet's life story. In the past, it was difficult for me as she was a resident of this building for a while. Then one day, someone said to me, the institution is closed. It's over. Go up there with a smile on your face and rejoice. So I will. Once, there was a place called the Laconia State School Training Center that housed individuals who developed into challenge. The very name was so deceiving, but there was no real schooling and not much training going on. People just existed in that sterile environment. In reality, it was nothing but a warehouse. A warehouse for human beings. It's such an insult to humanity. Back in 1901, legislation was passed that allowed for the New Hampshire School for the Feeble-Minded to be created. The doors of the school were opened in 1903. In January of 1907, then Governor Floyd announced that the institution had 85 inmates and another 100 were known to be proper subjects for admission. He went on to say that only a few inmates could safely be discharged. The only choice was between keeping them for life or letting them go free to travel the community and reproduce their kind. Marriage was prevented, sterilization was promoted, and to think that a building on this campus is named after him. Many years ago, when I was a student in grammar school, a classmate of mine was considered to be different. At times, she displayed odd behavior, made weird noises, crumbled up her dress, and her body would shake. The children were not kind to her. They made fun of her. They shunned her. And I was afraid of her. One day, Dorothy did not come to school. We never saw her again. That's when we found out that what Dorothy was experiencing were epileptic seizures. She was sent to Munson, an institution in Massachusetts that specialized in caring people who were afflicted with epilepsy. Little did I know how this would affect my life in years to come. There also was a family in the neighborhood whose youngest child never came out to play with us. We could hear the unusual sounds that he made. He looked different, and he walked with difficulty. Later, we were told that Richard was Mongoloid. Little did I know how personally I would become involved with individuals who were developmentally challenged. Janet, my youngest of three children, was born on August 30, 1961. When Janet was brought to me after her birth, I noticed right away that her right eye was closed. She would not open it, and I got quite concerned. Then I was told that this sometimes happens when too much silver nitrate is used, and that everything would be okay once the pupil dilated. Weeks went by with no change to the eye. She was seen by an eye specialist in town who then arranged for her to be seen at Mass Eye and Ear in Boston. The doctor at the clinic was noncommittal after examining Janet's eye and asked that we bring her back in two weeks. On her second visit, she was placed under anesthesia so that they could get a look at the back of her eye as well. The news was not good. We were told that not only was Janet's eye a third smaller in circumference, but that it also was not fully developed. We could do one of two things, have her eye fitted with a magnetic lens 
I had the eye removed and replaced with an artificial one that would correspond with the left eye. It was a crushing blow, and we had to have some time to think about it. Once home, I began to notice that Janet's eye on occasion would dot rapidly inward, and that her body would stiffen and shake. Janet was only two and a half months old, and she displayed signs of having serious problems. One morning while bathing her, she began to make odd sounds. Her eyes were dotting inwardly, and her whole body was shaking. I immediately took Janet to the hospital. After a brief examination, the doctor told me that he did that Janet had brain damage, and that I would have to take her into Boston Children's Hospital. There she remained for two weeks. The day before she was to be discharged, I was called down to the doctor's office and given her diagnosis. I was told that indeed, Janet had severe brain damage, had severe damage to the right side of her brain. Her right eye was not only smaller in circumference, but that there was no optic nerve, thus no vision, which we already knew. She would have no use of the left side of her body, and because of the brain damage, she was an epileptic. All the shaking that she displayed was in reality seizures. Thoughts of my former classmate Dorothy crossed my mind. The doctors then said that Janet would be nothing but a vegetable and recommended that we institutionalize her immediately and forget about her. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe that a doctor could be so insensitive that I cried all the way home. We brought Janet home the next day, determined to do all that we could to make her life as comfortable and meaningful as possible. We all, her father, her sister, her brother and I, worked with her every day, and you know what? She fooled us all. Janet did learn how to roll over, to sit up and attempted to creep and crawl. It just took her a little bit longer. She did learn how to walk, though limited. She became a hyperactive child, requiring little sleep, and was up a good part of the night. There were no services in the community for Janet. There was no one for me to talk to. There was no one for me to turn to. I soon wore down, both mentally and physically, and was hospitalized. I was so bitter, and all I could say is, oh God, why me? At the tender age of five years, two months, and 19 days, instead of attending preschool activities, Janet entered the Laconia State School and Training Center the only state institution in New Hampshire for the developmentally disabled. The entire family was devastated. I was still in the hospital, not allowed to see Janet before she was taken to Laconia. Once there, we were told not to come visit her for at least six weeks. As soon as I was discharged from the hospital, defying my doctor's orders, you know where I went. I sneaked out of the house and headed straight to Laconia constantly on the lookout for the place that I thought was going to be picking me up. Mm -hmm. I had to see Janet, and I just had to hold her. And once I got on campus of the U.S. Laconia State School, I had another problem. I didn't know what building she was being housed in, so I started looking in the windows of the first building that I came to, and what a sight I was to start of the hospital, and here I am peeking in windows. <laughs> but luck was with me. I finally spotted her. I got into that building and to what was the infirmary. I saw Janet's name on the chart so that I knew that I was in the right place. I identified myself to the nurse and asked to see Janet. She brought me down to a large ward. Janet was there alone. My poor baby was strapped down in bed with a posy jacket. She had been trying so hard to sit up that her elbows were sheet burns. I was allowed to hold her and was shocked to see that since her arrival, her spirit had already been broken. She was no longer the active child that I knew. The tears flowed uncontrollably. I was broken hearted and felt so full of guilt. Guilt that I was not able to take care of Janet. And that guilt will follow me to my grave. Janet's dad and I came to visit her every Sunday. I remember walking right past Janet, who was sitting on the floor in the ward. I didn't recognize her. Her hair had been chopped off. 
She was wearing a wrinkled, faded dress and had no shoes on. All of her clothes that we had provided disappeared and became community property. From that time on, I started to do all of Janet's laundry. We had a special bed made for her so that she would not be tied down in bed all night. There were drawers on the bottom of the bed. One side was for her clean clothes, and the other side was for the laundry that I would take home to do. I remember Janet having her face scrubbed with a cleaning agent. The person who did this did not know that it was the tub that she was supposed to wash and not Janet's face. Her chin was raw. Conditions at Laconi were deplorable. There were no shades or curtains in any of the windows. In the summertime, the wards in the Murphy building where Janet resided got extremely hot. Most of the residents were bedridden. None of them were ever brought out into the fresh air. There were no screens on the windows. Mark Pepin was a resident of Murphy Building. He was a self-abusive young man. He had two lobotomies, and neither one of them worked. I would see Mark in bed, always in restraints. A posy jacket on, his hands and feet were tied to the bed, a restraint around his waist that was also tied on either sides of the bed and he would be wearing a neck brace. In the summertime with the windows open, mocking restraints, and with all the flies that were on him that he couldn't shoo away, can you just imagine the agony that he had to endure day after day, hour after night, and even overnight? It's unforgivable. I went to a parent meeting and asked for their help to get shades and curtains put up in all of the buildings that our children resided in. They agreed, and the work was done. Janet's bed was between two windows and was shaded. Annie's bed, however, was in the direct sunlight, and her face would get beet red. She was nonverbal and couldn't speak up. I would plead with the head attendant to please move Janet, move Annie out of the sun. She would just say to me very nonchalantly, no need, the sun will be moving away shortly. <laughs> This got to be a little too much for me. So at the next parent meeting, I asked for their help again. I asked if we could air condition the Murphy building. They looked into the possibility of getting the job completed. The state agreed to do the electrical work, and the parent association purchased all of the units. And thank God for that. Not many parents came to visit their child, a family member of Laconia. One parent who I would see frequently was Mark's mother, Simone. She would stop me every time she ran into me and say, Mr. Smith, we have to do something about this place. And I tried to avoid her because I knew what would happen. I'd get involved and left hold in the bag. But she was persistent, and I soon would find myself in the middle of a controversy that eventually wound up in U.S. Federal Court. All of the wards were barren. Many residents just sat around on benches or on the floors. Others walked around talking to themselves. There were no televisions in most of the buildings. I spoke to many organizations in my hometown, and they generously donated many televisions, as did some stores and ladies' clubs. Eventually, there was TV in all of the wards. Many tours of the institution were conducted. One group that came from Nashua had a timeout room pointed out to them. They were told that they were no longer being used. Being the doubt, doubting Thomas that I was, I went over and looked in the small window that was high up on the door. And I was shocked to see Raymond, a resident, sitting on his haunches, staring up at me. The room was long, narrow, and had nothing in there, not even a chair to sit on. It was a beautiful day, and everyone from that building was outside. Everyone except Raymond. If a fire had broken out, would anyone have remembered that Raymond was in town out room? I think not. Through the years, ten dormitories and three cottages were built on campus. In the 70s, the more capable residents worked in the wards of the institution. They gave, dressed, and fed the severely handicapped residents. Scheduled diaper changes were done. If a resident soiled or wet their diaper, 
they would have to wait until the next schedule changed. And if the stench of her urine, it's oh, to me. If the stench of urine, a soiled diapers, was too strong, a sheet of blanket would be draped over them. On occasion, I observed residents medicating the children. Later on, the state was ordered to pay these working residents the minimum wage. Funds were not available for this. So after a brief training session on how to survive in the community, they were released. Many remained in the Laconia area, which had been home to them for many years. There would be five, six, seven, and even eight individuals living in one apartment. They would have dogs and cats living with them in these cramped quarters as well. And did they party? They got a check every month, which they blew real fast, and then resorted to stealing food from the grocery stores just to survive. What a mess it was. It was then that a new group of residents began working in the wards. Janet was transferred down to this building, the Doobie, where most of the residents were also bedridden. As the population at Laconia increased, the staffing remained the same, the same with a ratio of one staff person to every 20 to 25 residents. Minimal professional standards call for one staff person to every four residents under these conditions. Staff with no training were routinely asked to dole out meds such as amphetamines, barbiturates, and sedatives. Many received meds from the same spoon without being washed. The untrained staff were told to falsify reports that they filed out even though the programs were not carried out. I had to point out to one attendant that Janet was having a seizure because she didn't recognize it as such. Janet was given the wrong dosage of medication. The aide did not have her glasses on and misread the dosage. Another time, the aide referred to an outdated record. The corners of Janet's mouth were always cut. It was then that I found out that she and all the other residents were being fed with tablespoons. This made the feeding go faster. Can you imagine this going on with our children? I collected 400 teaspoons and donated them to the school. I then asked that Janet be fed with a teaspoon only. There was a grandparent program in a few of the buildings. Grandparents would come in and volunteer to feed the residents their new meal. They were on a schedule and were being picked up at a certain time to have their lunch. The food, the, res the food for the residents arrived in bags. The food was steaming hot. The residents were fed this hot food because the grandparents had to be ready when the band came to pick them up. Janet never mastered the art of drinking out of a glass. She drank out of a baby's bottle. What we did was cut a large X on the top of a nipple, fill the bottle with water, juice, or milk, and she would chomp it down. I was admonished for this, as it was not age appropriate. But I didn't care. The important thing was for Janet to get her much needed fluids. <coughs> we came to Laconia early on Sundays so that we could feed her her meal. Ice cream was usually dessert. We always took Janet out for the afternoon so we would fill two bottles with milk and add ice cream to it. One day I was called into the office and admonished for taking extra ice cream. I was told that I was depriving residents out of their dessert and I felt terrible. So every week after that, we brought up a half a gallon of ice cream with us. We used six tablespoons of it and left the rest there. A few weeks later, Superintendent Jack Milton called me to his office. He was really angry. He said, Frida, why didn't you come to me regarding the ice cream? There's no need of what happened. We make our own ice cream here, and we have more than we know what to do with. One Sunday, the nurse in charge of Doobie came to me and asked for my help. She told me that Sabrina, who was in the next ward, was very ill. There was no room for her at the infirmary. She asked me to go up to the infirmary and ask that Sabrina be brought up there for treatment. And that I did. Sabrina was brought up that afternoon. A few days later, Sabrina passed away. Physical restraints that we used, the straitjackets, 
elbow locks, helmets, mittens, and if shown aggressive behavior, the resident was placed in a 12 by 8 locked seclusion room. The forms of punishment, the residents were kicked, slapped, screamed at, had their hair pulled, had their heads banged against the walls, and they were denied food, and some were sexually abused. Very few staff people were ever disciplined, terminated, or suspended. Attorney Dick Cole and I witnessed a resident being struck repeatedly by a staff person. We reported this to the office. That person was suspended for a few days, then allowed to return to repeat the same abuse, most likely. How disgusting. Simone, Peggy, another parent of a resident, Laconia, and I began to speak at church and city groups and to the legislators in Concord. I was at Concord so often that everyone thought I was a legislator long before I got elected. We also wrote letters to the editors of all the leading newspapers in the state. I became active in my local ARC, the Laconia and New Hampshire ARC. Other parents of residents of Laconia also served on the board of directors of the New Hampshire ARC. We shared our concerns with the New Hampshire members, with the board members, and they in turn arranged for a tour of all the buildings on campus. The result of this tour was a blistering report that was released in the form of a fact sheet coupled with recommendations for changes that were necessary to help improve the quality of life for all of the residents who existed here. I can still see the headlines. Laconia State School and Training Center, a warehouse for human beings. The ARC played it up and we got a lot of mileage out of the publicity. This brought many reporters to the institution. One picture that was published showed a group of cubicles they were joined together. They resembled playpens. One resident was placed in each cubicle. They could either sit or stand in them. They could not lie down because they were too small. And they couldn't even stretch out. Nothing they could amuse themselves with were ever found in playpens either. Once the picture appeared in the newspaper, the pens were torn down. We were a challenge to Governor Thompson, and I tried to get all the public appearances that he made in my home area just to jog his memory about Laconia, until the point that when he saw me, he'd say, oh no, not you again. <laughs> and we did everything we could to keep the deplorable conditions at Laconia fresh in his mind. Soon Laconia became the topic of, dis of discussion, not only at the State House, but throughout the entire state as well. Radio and television exposure helped tremendously. One of our former congressmen had a son who resided here at the institution. Jake was so handsome. He always sat in the corner of what I called the dungeon, a ward in the basement that was dark, damp, and dreary. His head was always buried between his knees. He would sit that way for hours. So what else did he have to do? His father and mother came to Salem one day. I went to the town hall to see them. I spoke to the congressman about the disgraceful conditions that his son existed in, and I asked for his help. He listened to me, and when I was through, he turned and walked away. He never said a word. His wife came over to me, shook my hand, and said, if I can ever help you, please call on me. Jim Haddock, the executive director of the New Hampshire Art, was a personal friend of his. He always received a Christmas card from him. One year, the card had a family picture on it. Everyone except Jake. So Jim, was called, so Jim called the congressman and told him not to send any more family pictures unless the entire family was in it, including Jake. The congressman replied, if you tell anyone that I have a son at Laconia, I'll kill you. In 1976, I was introduced to a young attorney from New Hampshire Legal Assistance. I begged him to please help us parents to bring a class action suit against the state of New Hampshire on behalf of the residents of Laconia State School. 
having just completed a successful class action suit involving the state prison. He was reluctant to take on another suit so soon. I kept after him for over a year. Then Legal Assistance was hosting a brainstorming session that would be attended by approximately 100 low-income people. The purpose of this session was to come up with a list of priorities for Legal Assistance to address in the coming year. An invitation to attend this session was also extended to Jim Haddock and myself. Jim and I accepted that invitation and attended that session, fully knowing that our work was cut out for us. We broke up into small groups, with Jim and I attending different workshops every two hours. This went on all day Saturday and Sunday morning. Sunday afternoon, we had our last opportunity to try and convince everyone that our cause needed the most help. Evidently, our presentation was convincing, because after the votes were tabulated, the results announced, the class action suit for the Laconia State School residents was number one on the priority list and we were overwhelmed. These wonderful people in such dire need of help for themselves were sacrificing for our children. So powerful we were. I did a lot of thinking, I did a lot of soul searching, and I finally was able to say, oh God, and why not me? It can't get any worse, go for it. And from that day on, I was determined to do all I could to get the lawsuit filed, and one. Preparation for the lawsuit began shortly after. It was suggested that I write a letter to the U.S. Justice Department asking for an investigation of the institution. On September 1, 1977, two parents and I signed that letter and I sent it off to Washington, D.C., hoping for the best. The investigation was conducted and sufficient evidence of civil rights violations were uncovered that compelled the Justice Department to join the lawsuit. I was then contacted by two attorneys from the Mental Health Law Project out of Washington, D.C. They expressed an interest in the lawsuit and asked if I could get them on the grounds of the institution. They had a suspicion that abusive amounts of psychotropic drugs were being administered to the residents. I did, get the man I did manage to get them on tour of all the buildings and the staff, surprisingly, opened the med logs to them. The record showed that their suspicion of drug abuse was right on target. And oh yes, they wanted in. The parent organization gave them a $3,000 retainer, and they began to prepare for their part in the lawsuit. But not for long. The then Commissioner of Health and Human Services, Gary Miller, had testified for them as an expert witness on several occasions. He talked them out of participating in a lawsuit, and we never got a retainer back. Even after they had told us that this was the case they had long been looking for. I was at a convention in Washington and went to their office to see if I could collect our retainer. They wouldn't even come up to speak with me. I also was contacted by Geraldo Rivera's office. He too wants me to get him on the grounds and into all of the buildings as he wants to do an expose to Laconia. We had a date for his arrival. I got a call a few days before D-Day asking for a postponement as Bing Crosby had passed away and Geraldo had to cover his funeral. Another date was agreed on. Once again I got a call from that office asking for another reprieve. Geraldo had to cover the Panama Canal crisis. And by then I was a nervous wreck and cancel the whole thing. After many months of negotiating and no mutual grounds of agreement reached, it became obvious that the lawsuit would become a reality. Promises were made by Governor Thompson, and they were not on it. Laconia State School had to make deep cuts in their budget, while the governor defended his decision to allocate $4 million for the construction of a garage for free parking for the legislators. He also allocated $69,000 to renovate the garage at the governor's mansion. We felt betrayed and we were outraged. His priorities were certainly questionable to say the least, and he picked on the wrong people to antagonize. However, we were delighted that Dr. Governor Thompson was defeated in his try for the fourth term. Hugh Gallen not only inherited the Connor office, 
but he inherited the loss of his wealth. Gary versus Jalen was filed in U.S. Federal Court in Concord in April of 1980. My daughter Janet was named Plenty. Dick Cohen and John McIntosh were the lead attorneys for legal assistance. Lynn Reeser and Arthur Peabody represented the Justice Department. And they did one hell of a good job because of their efforts and their expertise. Our children are free. The lawsuit lasted for 10 long weeks. I know because I sat in that, con that, that courtroom every day of that trial. Many days, John DeStasso, a reporter from the Manchester Union Leader, and I were the only people in the courtroom besides the attorneys, the witnesses, the judge, and his staff. The trial pit parent against parent. Once friends, many stopped speaking to one another. Simone lashed out at me one day during court recess. She called me a liar. She said that I always wanted to close the school. Of course, that was not true. And all I could say to her was, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. Deep down inside, I know, I knew that she didn't mean what she was saying. I knew that she was concerned and frightened. She and her husband would never be able to take care of Mark should the institutionalization fail. She just wanted improvements to be made at the institution. And she felt threatened. Those who objected to the lawsuit rallied together and circulated a petition protesting the trial. They tried to offer it into evidence, but Judge Devine refused to accept it. The day that I was to testify, I was a nervous wreck, like today. <laughs> the courtroom was filled with staff from Laconia, who most likely wanted to rattle my cage and affect my testimony. I was shaking, and my hands were trembling. The lawyer from the DA's office, who was to cross-examine me, was working on her very first case as an attorney. She too was nervous, and her hands were trembling as she handed me a document to look at. So I reached over and covered her hand with mine, and I told her that I too was nervous, but that everything would be okay. She took a step back and just looked at me, and then she gave me a little smile and proceeded to question me. Believe me, I don't know where I got the courage to do that. I did quite well with my testimony because I, because I did, as I was told, tell the truth and tell it like you know it to be. And I did. One attestant testified that she had taken a resident down to the infirmary as she had fallen and had a gash in her eye. The doctor sutured the wound, the wound without Novocaine or anesthesia. It took four people to hold her down. When asked why he did it that way, he said, she is not the same as a normal person and doesn't feel pain as we do. No brain, no pain. At first, plans called for upgrading the institution and improving the quality of care and treatment of all the residents in the least restrictive environment. It soon became apparent that cosmetic changes to the institution would do nothing to improve the lives of those who existed here. The state of New Hampshire had no plans to close Latonia. However, attorneys for the plaintiffs told me that the end result of the lawsuit, as far as they were concerned, would be the closing of Laconia State School and that all of the residents would be coming back to live in the community where they could be better served, close to family and friends. The attorneys knew that once out of that sterile environment where so many of our children regressed, they would blossom and develop into useful, productive citizens. I was frightened, and I thought, my God, what if this doesn't work? What if the state and federal dollars dry up, forcing day programs and residential services to end? What we do then? Many parents were elderly and sickly and could never cope with caring for their children at home again. What would happen to the medically fragile individuals, my Janet included? The rest is history. The 10-week trial heard from 56 witnesses who testified in 41 court sessions. 
There were more than 250,000 individual submissions of evidence. Judge Devine handed down his decision on August 17, 1981. While well, he did not order the closing of the institution, he did order the state to prepare and implement individual treatment plans and programs. Both diagnostic and treatment services had to be improved. Improved residences, family care, foster care, and daycare were ordered. Each local school district with a child at Laconia had to pay for that special child's education and alternatives to institutional care, which became the cornerstone of which the current service system is built. Twelve area agencies were formed, and the exodus of Laconia State School began shortly after. The state of New Hampshire never repealed the decision, and the case is still open. One big mistake that was made as we planned for the trial was the lawsuit did not include individuals who had always lived at home. Many of these individuals are still waiting for services, and for that I apologize. The good news is that in three years, the wait list will finally be non-existent. <laughs> Our family was afraid of what may happen to Janet once the trial started, so we brought her home for four months. She did, not, she did return to Laconia for a short while. Her health had always been a worry. She was put on some new medication for her seizures, which made her lethargic. We were concerned, so concerned that we decided to take her directly into Children's Hospital in Boston. There she was treated and released. We brought her home, never to return to Laconia again. She was formally discharged a year later. Soon after the lawsuit was completed, our local ARC saw the need for housing for those who would be returning home. We formed a housing needs board committee and I became a board member. We applied to and received a grant from HUD to build a group home that would house eight individuals. The selection process began shortly after the house was completed. After being home for two and a half years, Janet moved into Toloka. This was the name that we chose for the home, using the first two letters of tender, love, and care. Most of the residents came from my hometown of Salem, and all of the parents knew one another. Several of the children had severe behavior problems. How could I tell a parent that her child did not belong at Laconia? Yet, Tolka, because of those behaviors, would anyone dare to tell me this was not a proper setting for my daughter? We had a combination of aggressive young adults mixed with a group who were absolutely defenseless. Once again, Janet got her lumps. Once again, the parents were friend who were friendly but not speaking to one another. Once again, we were divided. My personal opinion is that group homes of six, eight, or more are nothing but many institutions. The people that live in them receive very little attention because staff is so damn busy with cooking and cleaning and doing laundry and the never ending paperwork. The staff we had at Taloka when it first opened were inexperienced, given a little training, and were very young. They wound up putting the residents to bed early so that they could party the rest of the night. The turnover was tremendous. A former staff person called me one day and told me that while Janet was on her floor mat, a male resident would also get on the mat. And then he would get on top of her and hump her. They all got their jollies watching this, but did nothing to stop it. I immediately drove over to Toloka, packed her clothes, and as we were leaving, the house manager arrived and said, you can't do this. And I said, try and stop me. Janet remained at home for a month as we worked to correct what was going on and to try to stabilize the home environment. At first, our children were not accepted in the community. Most people had what we call the NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Thank God attitudes have changed. The problems at Toloka were addressed. And thanks to St. John, Don Shumway, the decision was made to open another home across town. On October 1st, 1987, 
Janet and three other individuals from Toloka moved into their home, which was just seven houses up the street from where I lived. Janet's dad had passed away in May, and he never got to see her move into the Brady house, which he so looked forward to. I can't say that all went well at Brady House, and there were problems with the managers and staff who did not belong in human services. But once Judy, the new house manager, and her staff arrived on the scene, all was exceptionally great. Two of the staff are still working at that same house. She was certainly a model for the state. Janet had always paid her residence tax to the town of Salem. She and her housemates were taken on hay rides to outdoor concerts, to the beach and to picnics at the park or the lake. They belonged to a theater group and took part in productions that were put on twice a year. But Janet and I knew that she was the star of the show. And none of this ever happened at Laconia. For several years, everything went smoothly at Brady House. Then Janet got quite bruised by one of her housemates two days in a row. Soon after, the house was downsized to just two residents. Janet and the young man that remained at the house were both very medically involved. Nurses came in to medicate and evaluate them daily. They both attended a day program, visited their doctors and dentists on a regular basis, and were very well taken care of. Janet's health remained a concern. In July of 2003, she wasn't acting like herself. I knew that there was something wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint what the problem might be. I brought it to all four of her doctors. Changes were made to, her, to some of her meds, and we were told what to look for. Discomfort was obvious many times, but nothing we observed prepared us for what was about to happen. Janet's blood levels were taken frequently as she had a history of anemia, and many times she wound up in hospital for transfusions. Her veins were so small that a porta cat had to be installed. And one Friday, in late February of 2004, the nurse took a sample of Janet's blood. It was after midnight that she called me back and said that I had to take Janet down to the hospital as she needed to receive two units of blood. I asked if it was life-threatening, and she said no, so I took her down the next morning. I just didn't want to get her out of bed that early in the a.m. We arrived at the hospital at 8 o'clock. She got her first unit of blood at noon, and her second at 2 p.m. As I started to get her cleaned up for her return home, she had a large BM, and it was black. The doctor had it tested, even though he knew from the color and the odor that we had a problem. He told me that Janet was actively bleeding internally and had to be admitted. Once in her room, she received another unit of blood. The next morning, I took her down for colonoscopy. After speaking with the doctor, he elected to do an endoscopy first. Half hour later, he came to me with a devastating diagnosis that Janet had esophageal cancer. He said it was a very aggressive tumor that had already cut a two-thirds of her esophagus and that she maybe had two months to live. Once again, I was in a state of shock. I thought surely that a mistake had been made, but the doctor told me sadly that it was so. We brought Janet back to Brady House, where staff and I remained by her side 24-7. God knew that she was tired, that her work here on earth was finished. On March 20th, 2004, God took her home. There's no doubt in my mind that she's an angel, a saint in heaven. She was only 42 years old. In the past, doctors have told me that she would not live beyond her 30th birthday. So those 12 extra years were a bonus. I still can't believe that she's gone. I'm still in denial five and a half years after she passed away. And the only thing that keeps my sanity is the fact that Janet showed no signs of pain or discomfort because of the medication. And for that, I shall be eternally grateful. It 
half hour before she passed away, Shannon opened her eyes and just stared at me. I was holding her in my arms when she closed her eyes and took her final breath. She looked so peaceful and so serene. I missed her terribly. I loved her so. She was my life. Judy, the house manager, had said, it's a good thing we're not around Janet for the first couple of hours after her arrival in heaven and was able to speak. She had plenty to get off her chest. Her language would have been pretty strong. <laughs> <laughs> we all knew that Janet was the boss. My friend and I owned a travel company and many times I was away on schooling trips. I always let the staff at the house know when I would be leaving, when I would be coming back, and where I'd be traveling to. I called every day to see how Janet was doing. Many times when she knew that I was going away, she would get herself so worked up that I would have to cancel my plans, like the time I was supposed to escort 60 people to Las Vegas. Janet would listen to my conversation with the staff and understood what I was saying. So I started to spell my schedule so that she wouldn't know when I was leaving. When I got back, I got the treatment. No hugs, no kisses. And when I tried to kiss her, she'd push me away. She wanted no part of me. That was my punishment. There'd be some time before she forgave me for being absent and would finally raise her face for me to kiss. And what I wouldn't give to ever hear to raise her face for one more kiss. They say that if you find a penny, it is a message from a loved one who is in heaven. Needless to say, I'm always walking around with my head down <laughs> looking for pennies. I do have quite a collection. I found my last penny on my birthday in 08. None since then. I guess she's having too much fun to do. <laughs> By the early 90s, the population at Laconia State School drastically reduced. It then became increasingly expensive to care for the few that were still here. I was invited to come up to witness the departure of the last remaining resident. I watched as Superintendent Rich Crocker walk the door of this building. That act closed Laconia forever. We all applauded as tears of happiness ran down our cheeks. And I still get goosebumps when I think of that day. New Hampshire has the distinction of being the first state in the nation to close the doors of their institution. It helped to close the doors of their institution that housed developmentally challenged individuals. And for that, we can all be proud. And many other states have followed since. But I need to say something about us old timers. You know, it took a lot of courage on the part of the parents, of residents of Laconia, to support the closing of the institution. We are the pioneers who blazed the trail and have made it so much easier for the parents of children with disabilities today. Because our struggle forced the changes that created the services that are now available. This allows many families to keep their children at home. I hope that no one will ever have to experience the heartache and the devastation of placing a child in an institution as our families did. I hope that you all know and understand how far we have come and what we went through to get to this point. You all have to stand together and speak up. Don't let them take away anything of what we worked so hard to get for our children. We have passed the torch on to you and the young parents. As the fight for services for our loved ones continue, do whatever it takes to make your voices heard. Be persistent and don't accept the band-aid approach for funding for these services. Our children have the right to be treated with the dignity and respect that is so rightfully theirs. The former Commissioner of Health and Human Services, John Stevens, is gone now. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. When I <laughs> When I heard that while he was still a commissioner, he thought that reopening the institutions again would be a good idea, a good cost-saving idea. And all I could say is that would be over my dead body. And I had the opportunity to tell him that face-to-face, -face, and it didn't go over too well. 
He didn't know what he was talking about. He needed to be educated. He needed to face reality regarding people with disabilities. He obviously didn't place much value on our loved ones' lives. Do they deserve to be sentenced to a life in an institution? People live in homes, not institutions. So fight with all your might for whatever services are needed for our children. Get to know Commissioner Nick Trumpus. He's a very compassionate person and will listen to you and will do, will do all he can to help you. I think he's the greatest. Make friends with your legislators. Invite them to your meetings. Be vocal with them. Share your successes and your concerns and hold them responsible at election time. It is vitally important that you know what is going on in Congress at all times. Never shall I forget the grim reality of what happened here for so many years. And never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies were held captive here. Institutions must never be a way of life again. We must never, ever forget that there was once a place called Oconee State School and Training Center.